everyone, and welcome to our lunchtime chat today. Professionals who call themselves trichologists are on the rise. Those of you who aren't aware, a trichologist is an expert in diseases of the hair and scalp. But if you are a hair professional and you have a burning desire to help those with hair loss, what qual qualifiers should you be looking out for before claiming that title? And for consumers, what about some of those things that you should know about the industry before choosing to see a practitioner of trichology? These are some of the many questions that we'll be answering on today's chat. My name is Dr. Crystal Porter, and I am a hair scientist and owner of Maine Insights, a company that conducts research and focuses on the hair needs from people of African descent. This platform is designed to elevate the Black hair care industry and empower consumers and hair professionals with education that is driven and backed by scientific research. Before I get started, let's all see who's out there with me today. Welcome. Let's put your name in the chat and let me know where you're from. Also, I'd like to know your background. Put the number one if you are a practitioner the number two if you are a consumer, and the number three if you are a researcher or a scientist such as myself. Also, if you haven't done so already, I'd like for you to share this broadcast. You don't want to be stingy, and there are other people who may benefit from the information. Okay, and so if you are frustrated with the lack of information available to you when it comes to caring for your hair, and you've wasted a lot of time, money, and resources trying to figure things out on your own, then you are definitely in the right place. And that is why we have created the Our Black Hair Matters movement. And before we get started, I have put together a valuable resource called the three biggest mistakes to avoid when curling, when caring for your curly hair. You can go to obhm.com or ourblackhairmatters.com to get that. And you can see that in the ticker. And if you have a pressing concern and need to have a conversation, our team is standing by. <clears throat> and you can schedule a 15-minute call by going to bit.ly slash obhmconsult. And you can see that also on the screen. All right. So we are going to get started because we have a lot to get to. Um, now, I have voiced my opinion about the area of trichology in many settings. A few weeks ago, I had a lunchtime chat about it. And then back in 2016, actually tomorrow will be exactly six years, I wrote an article in Medium titled Hair Loss and the World of Trichology, Why You Should Care If You Want to Save Your Hair. And if we could have that banner put up, that would be great. And so you can actually go there um, by going to bit.ly slash medium dash trichology and it's case sensitive. So it's a capital M and a capital T. And so while I've given my opinion, I wanted to get the perspectives from those who are immersed in the field. So I'd like to have my special guest join me who agreed to be a part of a panel discussion today. So, my educators are both affiliated with the schools to provide their, um, well, they're affiliated with schools to provide their trichology curriculum. So I would like to start with Connie Judge. Let me get my notes here for the bio because I have a lot of people here today. So Connie Judge is known internationally as a visionary entrepreneur, renowned beauty industry leader in trichology. And she is the first and only African-American owner of a trichology training institute in the United States. She presents a courageous, honest, and heartfelt perspective on real-world issues concerning hair loss. Then we have Dr. David H. Kingsley, and he is the president of the British Society Corporation and the World Trichology Society. He is the only trichologist in the world who is a member of the American Academy of Dermatology and the American Hair Research Society and qualified as a certified trichologist in 1980 and attained his doctorate through the University of Portsmouth. He is a senior profession, uh, professor at the World Trichology Society and a professor at Huntington University of Health Science. Then we have Marvelette Bailey, who is a certified trichologist. She is known as a pillar in the beauty industry. 
and has over 30 years of experience backed by in-depth training, license, licensure, certifi and certifications. Marvelette continued her education and training in the paramedical and science field, becoming a psychology healthcare practitioner and biomedical resident with Maine Insights. And she's also one of my team members. Mm -hmm. Carrie Parker is also a certified trichologist, and she became um, or she began to infuse holistic therapies into into her services. In March of this last year, she became a certified trichologist through WTS in New York City. Then we have Donisha Sullivan, who is a certified trichologist with over 18 years of service, providing hair loss prevention and restoration for men and women who suffer from hair loss. She is, a she is licensed in the state of Georgia and North Carolina as a master cosmetologist. She currently owns a hair and scalp treatment center in Georgia, um, in Augusta, Georgia, and also provides non-surgical hair replacement services. And last but not least, we have Dana Wilson, and she is a certified trichologist, a Sister Locks master trainer, a city certified research assistant, and certified um, cold capper. She is also a veteran and mother of a son with um, autism. She is the director of Hair Pairs, Inc., and began her own Sister Locks journey in 2000. She is also a team member along with the, um, Donisha as well. All right, so we have gone through all of that. Thank you, welcome, really happy to have you all here. Thank you. All right, so we are going to jump into it. I want to start off with a question for the practitioners. I want to know in about a minute or so, um, how did you learn about trichology and why did you decide to become a practitioner? Let's start with Denisha. Okay. Um, well, I took a course in um, hair loss as a hair loss practitioner, and it opened my eyes to how the body um, functions and then also how hair loss is correlated. And so I wanted to learn more. I wanted to understand how uh, hair loss begins and how to address it and how to be effective with treating it. And so I continued my studies in trichology from that course. Awesome. Thank you. And Dana, what about you? Um, I had a friend who was a trichologist. Um, and so I learned about what that was. And then also I started experiencing hair loss myself. So I, I needed to dig deep and see what was going on with myself and then also some of my clientele at the time. So um, very interesting. <laughs> awesome. And how about you, Carrie? Yes, yeah, so I, I have eczema and um, I didn't have hair from the top of my ear down to the nape until I was 15 years old my grandmother was a beautician and she was able to recover my hair in the course of the summer um and then that led me to about 20 years in my career and just was wanting to do something different i didn't want to get out of the beauty industry but wanted to do something inside different inside of it and with that i we would as we would hear these terms growing dandruff all the time i kept thinking that doesn't sound right to me and then we would also scratch the scalp, um, scratch someone's scalp with a comb. And I kept thinking that doesn't seem like that should be healthy for the scalp. But I didn't really know. And one day I was scratching someone's scalp and this uh, distributor came by the, my suite and said, you know, you don't have to do that. I'm like, please tell me what can I do not to do this? I hated doing it. And that's what led me to trichology. Awesome. And Marvelette? Well, um, when I worked in salons, I always got the class nobody else wanted who had hair loss or hair issues. So I would correct them. I don't know how. So I, whatever I was doing was working. So that sparked the interest. So I did like 10 years worth of research. And then I started going to different classes. And I came across a few people who were trichology, well, who had taken classes for trichology, like three or four day classes. Um, and that sparked my interest. So I did further research. And then I found the school that I went to. Awesome. And so speaking of schools, let's talk about the schools. And so Connie, Judge, um, can you talk about NTTI? I think it's a great segue since that's where Marvelette got her trichology education. 
Thank you. And uh, I also thank you for allowing me to be a part of this platform. I think this is an amazing opportunity to share uh, knowledge about trichology and how all of this evolved. From my perspective and how I got started in trichology, um, being a licensed cosmetologist myself for many, many years, uh, looking at almost 40 years that I've been in the beauty industry, I actually had a lot of clients who lost hair and I didn't know and didn't have solutions for those clients. So I began to research to try to find something that gave me more understanding about hair loss. And of course, just doing that on my own, I discovered some things and then talking with other doctors were very helpful. How I evolved into the school of psychology and doing what I'm doing now is from my background as being a school owner. I started in the school business in 1997. So I have been in the school business for a very long time. Uh, knowing the proper procedures to have a school uh, after selling one of my schools and moving to Middle Georgia and then on up to Atlanta, I wanted to go the proper way in terms of having a school. So I had a door to open for me to go to London in 2008 just to learn a little bit about the UK and how they were doing it there because we had no real school here in the US and just had some collaboration with that entity in the UK. I did not get a certification from the UK, by the way. I think that was one of, part of what you had here. But my actual certification came here inside of the US once we were able to get our school authorized uh, through post-secondary here. So I uh, actually sold my last school in Albany, Georgia, moved to Atlanta. It took three years for me to get the school authorized through post-secondary here in the state of Georgia because there was no written curriculum in the US for the board to measure this program by. And so in 2009, I was invited to go to Sawan uh, Women's College in uh, Sawan near Seoul, Korea. Uh, mm -hmm. Professor Moon, who had been the professor there for many, many years, actually allowed me to work with that campus. And I was the first African-American that they had ever had on that particular campus to teach Korean students about African-American skin disorders and diseases of the scalp. And they permitted me to use their curriculum to bring back to the U.S. for the post-secondary board of education here, which is NPEC, to use as a standard to measure my program by. And it actually took them two years still to approve me for the program. So May of 2011, our program was authorized by the post-secondary board of education here in the state of Georgia. And that's how we got our school. And that's how we began to be able to provide diplomas you know, and certificates for our students who would go through a year of training with our program. And that's how it all evolved for me. And I'm excited, you know, about what we're doing to help change lives and to bring people into a perspective. Uh, lastly, our motto for our school is education with integrity. And I believe that if one is going to acclaim a title, that education is the key and that that particular documentation that they carry should come through the governing of a real board of education that provides coverage for anyone who says they're putting a program out there. They need to have a governing body of education to govern their program. Mm -hmm. OK. And so, Dr. Kingsley, how did hey, you get started hey, and Crystal. how did you develop your school well, or your program for your school? Well, I obviously, you can see, I started many, many years before Connie did. Um, I originally from London, um, I qualified as a trichologist in 1980 through the Institute of Trichologists, which is the oldest trichological organization in the world. Uh, I moved to the United States um, shortly thereafter, and I was practicing trichologist here. I was a member of two or three organizations, but they were based either in the UK or in Australia. And I'm saying to them, look, you've got to put a presence, you know, you've got to have something in the United States. So what we decided to do was to start a, a US-based trichological organization so that it, you know, we felt that it was a lot better for US students to have um, contact with people in their own time zone and not like 10 hours or 12 hours apart. Um, so the organization, uh, we, uh, we went for high 
um, educational standards, ethics, everybody has to sign uh, an ethical standards. Um, also, we help students throughout the course with uh, webinars, newsletters, tutorials, uh, easy payment schedule, and which we also find important is post certification educational courses and professional development. Uh, our motto is education, 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 and that's what we try and do. Recently, uh, we have also uh, had our course licensed by Florida State Education Authority, uh, the Commission for Independent Education. Uh, our course is certified, excuse me, through them, so that the students now have assurance of financial stability and program structure regarding the WTS. So, um, you know, we feel that the a trichologist needs to have a certain educational standards, exactly what Connie said, um, and also post certification, because it's fine that they're certified trichologists, but just like with every profession, how do you know they're keeping up the standards? And we have a, a trichology uh, credit where they, our members need a certain amount of credits a year to keep their membership up so that people who choose to see AWTS uh, certified trichologists, they know that they are keeping up at a certain level and, and that is also what we felt very important. Okay, and so I want to kind of go with your background because you received your trichology education overseas in the UK. So sure. how does that differ? I mean, I know you wanted to expand it and you had the idea of telling the other societies to come here to the US, but what could you do in the UK with your training that you may not be able to do here and vice versa? Do you know? Well, you know, it's 40 years ago. Uh, so a lot of things have changed. Um, I think one of the big, I mean, it's not directly answering the question uh, because it's very difficult to do that. But I think the biggest plus nowadays is the internet. Because when the courses were in the UK, when I became certified, uh, there was no internet. So really the worldwide access, and, and I understand you're mainly interested in the US, but it's also a worldwide uh, uh, science. Uh, the access was very difficult because people had to come to the UK to become certified. Now that the internet is here, we, we have students. We just had clinical training at students from Kenya, South Africa, and Dubai, and the Netherlands, and all around the world. And it, it truly, we feel that it's so important not just to keep the standards high in the US, but to keep the standards high worldwide as well. So um, it's, it's difficult to say the difference between the um, Institute of Trichologists and the World Trichology Society, except that both organizations are trying to keep standards high. And uh, that's what we're continuously trying to do. Okay. So speaking of standards, there are a number of pro professionals out there. And when I voice my opinion about my perspective about uh, trichology, um, as I said, I wrote something up six years ago because there are a number of things going on um, when professionals decide to go that route. So I'm curious for the practitioners who are here or the certified trichologists, I wanna know what were you, what was your criteria to decide where you wanted to go? Um, let's start this time with Carrie. Okay, so I actually, to piggyback off of Dr. Kingsley, it was because this is my 14th year. And so 14 years ago, like I mean, we did have the internet, but it's not like it was at all then versus now. Um, and so, because I started off with the IAT, and 
to get the books and that was just it was hard and how do i get to australia for clinicals that was so difficult so um I kind of look, I started looking around. I was um, talking to a colleague and she told me that she had went to WTS. And so I started digging and then it allowed me to be able to see the other, you know, the other um, programs that were out there. And so I kind of felt, I mean, it's not really probably the best way, but this was just my way of just kind of, to be honest. I just looked at the websites to kind of see what, what did the website speak to me and then what were they offering inside of it and also the accreditation as well because initially i didn't think anything about accreditation i knew what accreditation was but i didn't know what that was like in the trichology sphere um so i started looking at that too and then looking at the cost quite naturally so i looked at the cost to see what the cost was like how were we able to make payments or not did you have to pay it up front um and then the the support as well would it be any type of support would they even if you call were they even answer the phone some of the schools wouldn't even answer the phone they didn't even respond to email for me to email them to ask questions about their program that had a lot to do with it with it as well okay and how about you donisha um so for me at the time i was running a full salon and um single parent, two children, and I needed a program that, um, well, just back up a little bit. So I took the hair loss practitioners course, which was um, kind of like an introduction to trichology. And that course helped me to understand more about the body systems and that intrigued me. And so I needed something that I could, that I could learn the way that I need to learn, which is in a classroom setting. Um, and that the course could be broken up so that I can take the time to study, practice, and then move forward. And so I chose uh, USTI because of that, because it was a program that I could take um, in segments, practice, and then take the next sections. Um, also, USTI offered a third party certification through AMCA, which I was intrigued by. So. Um, once I completed my full trichology with them, um, then I went on to take the third party testing for the AMCA trichology certification. Um, and so that was, uh, that was how I decided to take the, with the program that I decided to go into. Okay. Thank you. And Marvelette, how about you? Um, similar to Donisha, um, so I was married at the time. I had two children. I was a salon owner. So location was a factor. Um, cost was an issue, uh, mm -hmm. was a factor, and accreditation. So I looked at a lot of schools. Actually, a couple of schools I initially started uh, seeking, I didn't go there. I chose NTTI because uh, I took a class at the, at the ABS show, and Connie Judge was there, NTTI. And I like what she said. And initially... She was supposed to come to Chicago to teach the class so when I signed up, but something happened, so we ended up having to go to Atlanta, which wasn't in the plan, but it worked out anyway. And the cost was decent, so I was able to pay for it out of pocket, um, and I was able to travel back and forth. I talked with my husband. He agreed to it, and it worked out. Awesome. And Dana? And so like most of the other folks on the panel, um, busy. I had a busy life, <laughs> uh, a lot of clientele. So uh, flexibility was a huge factor for me. And I went to NTTI, which was great because it had hands-on. So that was the main thing that I wanted hands-on. I didn't want just online um, training. Also, because I'm a veteran, um, cost, I needed to look at cost. And um, the VA actually would pay for me to go to NTTI because it was accredited and have uh, the backing of a, a post-secondary uh, school. So that was a huge piece for me um, because obviously the VA um, does all the vetting for you. So that was a no-brainer for me <laughs> and the hands-on for sure, for sure was it. Awesome. So we are live and I want to make sure that I address everyone. So um, I think everyone has access to the comments, but I just want to let people know who are out there. Uh, we have Miss Safi or Safi, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing your name right. Thank you for joining from Detroit. 
we have Samaria. Um, and Samaria said that she actually um, went to um, WTS. So she is here. We have Dana Majors who says hi to Connie Judge as well because she is a NTTI grad. But then we have someone who comes up as Facebook user and um, they obviously know me, <laughs> um, but I, it comes up as Facebook user, so I don't know who it is, but says, hello, Crystal, Connie, and David. Nice to see you all. Um, and thank you for having this discussion. As you know, I am a board certified dermatologist and licensed cosmetologist. Oh, okay, so it's probably Dr. Lindsay. And I do a good amount of work partnering with cosmetologists on education around hair loss. I would love to hear your thoughts on a growing trend that I have been observing, especially on social media, of the negative opinion expressed by trichologists for dermatologists as the physician experts of treatment of hair and uh, probably scalp disease is probably what she said um, it ended. So um, let's start off with you, Dr. Kinsley. What sure. Hi, Yolanda. I know Yolanda very well. Um, I, I, I disagree. I, well, at least through the way that we teach uh, our trichologists is to work with a dermatologist. Uh, there are a lot of conditions that trichologists can't treat or need a dermatologist to maybe diagnose. Uh, cicatricial alopecias, uh, which is scarring alopecias, things like that. And um, I think it's important that trichologists work very closely with dermatologists. The main difference, however, I, I think, is that a lot of dermatologists do not have the time to spend with their patients to discuss lifestyle factors that might be influencing their hair loss, such as maybe stress factors or dietary factors or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I don't know, you know, when I go to a dermatologist, usually they have five, 10 minutes with me. Whereas if you go to a trichologist, they usually have an hour uh, for the consultation. So I, 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 in fact, my vision is for every dermatologist's office to have a trichologist to deal with their hair loss uh, patients. Uh, whereas at the moment, if you, a lot of uh, dermatologists also have PAs who would see a hair loss patient uh, and they might not necessarily uh, have the background that a certified trichologist would have. So. I, I again, I, I think that trichologists and dermatologists should work together. Absolutely. Awesome. And Ms. Judge? Uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Kingsley on that particular point, as well as uh, respect highly uh, the dermatologist that asked that question. She is renowned and well known in the industry and does a tremendous job as uh, working with patients. One of the things that we teach our students in our program is that they are not to diagnose anyone. They don't have credentials to diagnose anyone. They can only identify an issue and recommend them to a dermatologist or to a medical doctor uh, because that's really against the law for someone who is a basic practitioner to try to diagnose a disease of the scalp. I think we need to learn how to stay in our own lane uh, that's one of the issues that we see that is running rampant in the beauty industry overall, uh, where the improper uh, learning about trichology is not being made very clear and defining. And that's causing some of the havoc that the doctor, the dermatologist is speaking about, you know, on this uh, live today. And that needs to be addressed. I think that's a whole nother different topic altogether that should be a well-rounded conversation that demands a show all by itself just to address that to really bring clarity in that area and while i have this moment i do want to qualify and quantify a statement um that Mavlet made because i thought that was appropriate for her to mention when she started it was one thing but she ended up having to come to georgia and the reason why she had to come to georgia 
is because the state post-secondary here in Georgia says those students have to be enrolled in Georgia uh, because our program was based out of Georgia. So those students would have to be an enrolled student in the state of Georgia with a certification or a diploma out of the state of Georgia under this governing body here. And so it was necessary to make the trip. Uh, we, of course, fast forwarded now with things changing uh, that we're able to do some things now online and even save our students some of the travel that they once had to do. Marblet and Dana went a great distance and some of that has been modified and changed through post-secondary with some of the approval process that we've had. And I do want to point out one other thing and I'll give it back over to you, Chris. So I'm glad to hear Dr. Kingsley say that he is now licensed or if he's calling it a license, I don't know the term for uh, Florida. Uh, but Georgia is not a licensure program, it is a diploma program. Uh, so uh, I'm concerned about all the people that were certified or authorized or whatever that term was prior to his being then licensed or whatever the case may be in the state of Florida, because I know you've been in business for a long time. So how do we rectify that, Dr. Kings, with all those people that was put out there with credentials prior to your licensing? Well, it's actually a licensed diploma uh, through Florida. And um, the since it has been licensed, uh, a very similar course has been licensed. I don't think that there's any issue with that, uh, Connie, at okay. all. Um, and um, also, uh, I would agree with Connie about, you know, uh, trichologists don't diagnose, they assess or they identify. And that is very strictly uh, taught to the WTS students, yes. So um, I, I wanna hit on that a little bit at, you know, a little later, but I want to follow up on Dr. Lindsay's comment because I have seen the negative comments um, that a lot of trichologists are speaking about how they're able to service um, the population in ways that dermatologists can't. And so that is like the negative expressions that I think she's referring to. And I think that, and I don't want to put words in people's mouth, but what I really believe is what they're feeling. I mean, it's, to me, it's this huge gap that exists between the dermatologist and the trichologist. And I'm trying to bridge that gap, which is why I have the program that I have, because in having professionals involved in research and having an appreciation of science, I think that's a way that we can bridge the gap because I think dermatologists feel strongly one way. I think Dr. Lindsay and Dr. Barbosa are the exception, but I think dermatologists typically think one way and then trichologists think the opposite extreme in another way. And I think we need to bridge that gap, but something needs to happen. Trichologists need more than just, I feel, the trichology education if they want to talk about science, because I hear a lot of trichologists say, oh, I'm all about the science, and they have no clue about what science is, which is why I'm trying to step up a little bit and saying, okay, if there's a gap, there's a need gap, let's go ahead and address that so that dermatologists and trichologists can work together because the trichologists need to respect the dermatologist. But in the same vein as to what Dr. Kingsley said in terms about time that can be spent, I think it can be a very happy relationship if a lot of dermatologists also can appreciate what the trichologists um, can bring, but it has to be done in the right way. And I do think a lot of trichologists do go overboard when they start talking about what they can do and start really um, bad mouthing dermatologists for no reason. May I jump in on that for a second, Crystal? Absolutely. Um, I think when a, as a licensed cosmetologist myself for 38, almost 39 years now, I think when a, tri when a cosmetologist say I'm all about the science, I think they're saying something different than what you're saying. Your understanding of science as with your PhD, with what you do with hair science and what we learn in beauty college with science is totally different. It's just totally different. You are at a 21st century technology way of expressing that, wherein a lot of the licensed cosmetologists are left behind. 
and they don't get that. So I think you're doing an amazing job in trying to bridge that gap. But I can tell you that that gap is so far and wide that it won't be bridged in my lifetime or your lifetime because it is so far spread at this point. But just to make a dent in this, all of us coming together on this platform together, saying the same language and speaking the same language, it needs to go out to the universe. Because cosmetologists must go back to school to be re-educated about the science you're talking about, the science Dr. Kingsley is talking about, the science I'm talking about. They've got to go back to school. That's the biggest task there is getting them to come back to school to be re-educated because most of them that are saying I'm all about the science has been out there for probably 20 plus years doing hair that has no in-depth understanding about the science and where we are today when it comes to science. Um, I commend everybody on this panel who is doing some form of education is trying to bring people into the know. But the problem is, again, getting them to sit down in a classroom with people like us at a panel discussion to break down what's the 21st century science that you need to know. People's lives have changed. Stress is a number one factor that's causing hair loss on the whole planet right now with this pandemic. What does science mean to that? And so, you know, there's work to be done. Lastly, when it comes to the dermatologist, Dr. Kingsley made a great point. Every dermatologist needs a trichologist working in that office with them to offset the time that they don't have to spend with a patient. That's what we hear with our patients. We have a clinic here. I have a clinic that is attached to the 7,000 square foot facility we are housed in for our school. And I have an internal medicine doctor that's full time as a partner here who see patients as well as us partnering with these dermatologists that we send them out to. Any dermatologist that we send a patient out to, we want a relationship with that dermatologist to help that dermatologist that may not know about the hair loss factor, but the skin factor so that they know what we're sending them. It's the communication that needs to take place and the relationship that needs to take place. So I'd like to see more of us come together with dermatologists in the room, with the trichologists and the cosmetologists in the room. I think that would bring, you know, great solutions along with what you're doing, Crystal, with the hair science. So that's a great solution. Thank you. you. Know, that's, if you don't mind, uh, Dr. Crystal, um, I, I, you know, what Connie says is, is uh, very good. Um, going back, uh, I, in fact, it's even on our first page of our website that trichology is the bridge between cosmetology and dermatology. So that bridge is vast. And as Connie said, it's a lot of work to bridge the bridge, as it were, uh, to, or to cross the bridge, or at least to uh, link the bridge. But, um, you know, the science is, uh, I mean, trichology is a science. And as Connie was saying, to go back to school, I mean, most people that become trichologists are mature students. Most people um, are already working with families. I mean, the, the panel here are all in that situation and kudos to them to do a course and have a business and have a family. And it is very difficult. And that's one of the reasons why WTS, we structure our payments so that people just buy one chapter at a time and some some students, you know, life happens. It might take them three or four years, and that's fine as well. Um, but we, uh, in the WTS, we have uh, weekly webinars of science that uh, to help um, students and certified trichologists to learn a little bit more. You know, education, post-certification education, I believe is almost as important as pre graduation um, education because you need to keep up to date. There's very few subjects out there with such fast changing knowledge. I, I send out a monthly uh, newsletter which has sort of latest uh, health news and papers that are published in dermatology journals regarding, you know, trichological issues. And there are like 30 or 40 every month. So it, we find it very important to keep the standards. And I did mention this before. We, we have the continuing trichology education credits. It's so important to keep, uh, to keep education standards as high as possible. And also, which is unique, I think, to the WTS, we have free access to something called Science Direct, 
which is over 12,000 medical and health journals that people can just look through and not just about trichological issues, you know, about other issues as well. Um, and um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Connie. Education, science is important. And people get a little scared about science, particularly if they haven't been to school or been into an education standard for a long time. But I believe if it's taught in the right way and, and given to the student in the correct way, that it is understandable. And we have tutorials, online tutorials every month, or even private ones if people want that, uh, where I will have a panel of people would come on, uh, students, and ask me questions uh, about it. And, and that's part of the uh, cost cost. So, you know, there are lots of different ways that we work around that and help our students. Okay, and thank you for that. So I want to um, read, and I think this is also Yolanda Lindsay saying that she agreed with both of the responses by you, Dr. Kingsley, and you, Ms. Judge, um, said, I agree, Connie, this issue requires an entire conversation. I am seeing lots of trichologists diagnosing individuals with various forms of hair loss. So, yeah, um, that I is mean, I, I problem. Think, I think, uh, Dr. Chris, I'm sorry. Um, you know, we, we can't be, Connie and I can't be the trichology police. You know, we can only, if you like, police our own members. And if there is an issue with one of our members, then we will, you know, presumably somebody would send us an email saying, you know, Jane Doe, uh, is is uh, causing, you know, has done this, this and this, and we will look into it. So, you know, th th there are people, as uh, Dr. Lenzi says, uh, but it needs to be brought to our attention that that is happening, and then we can correct it or try and correct it. Yeah. And, and in closing, Crystal, just one key point to what Dr. Kingsley said. Um, I think the, the big deal that has happened here is the pop-up schools, quote unquote schools, that have didn't have all of their due diligence in place and didn't really understand all of what they were teaching. They saw this as an opportunity. In the beauty industry, here's what happens. If a new word, hairdressers lock on. If there's a new class, hairdressers lock in. And so people begin to self organized, self-ordained, quote unquote, themselves as instructors in trichology. People started putting their own little curriculum together and popping up and teaching people. And they had no real science understanding of what they were doing. They were pulling information from other organizations and patching things together. And they started these other programs that were not governed and authorized by a board of education of any sort. And that's where most of the damage came from. I'm talking from the very inception of when I started trichology. 12 years ago. Dr. Kingsley been around much longer than I have in this because he came from the UK where it all originated from. But in the US standard, when I started this, I told my first two graduating classes of students, you guys get the education. Now, Marvelette was one of the first ones that graduated from my program in 2011. I said to them, when hairdressers discover this and other people discover this, they're going to contaminate this industry. Marvelette can probably agree with me making that statement. And that's exactly what has happened down through the years. These other people started their own deal. And so now all of this confusion and diagnosing and all of this is coming out of that crop of things that happened, you know, from back then and brought it forward. So, yeah, there's a problem. And yes, we do yeah. need to address that. And I agree them. because there are some organizations, Connie, and you must be aware of them, that certify people in two days. I mean, come Absolutely. on. Absolutely. You know, how are you going to get the knowledge? I say to people this, are you, let's say one of your uh, teenage daughters has alopecia areata. Do you want to take them to a trichologist who was certified in two days? You know, and it's just, um, it's it's really difficult for, I, I, I hope I'm not talk, putting words in Connor's mouth, but for Connor's organization and our organization to deal with this because people are saying, well, I, I was certified, you know, two, four days maybe. Um, and then, I, you know, 
why can't I join your society? And I say, uh, well, we don't look at, you know, you as a fully certified trichologist, because how could you be? Uh, and, you know, it, it, it's difficult, Connie, isn't it? it it's very difficult. Yes, it is. And I think, I think, Dr. Kingsley, now that you've made this move, because you and I had this conversation five years ago when I talked to you yeah. about becoming authorized, I think you and I need to have a sidebar conversation, put our heads and our hearts together and try to become one in rectifying some of the damage that's being done out here in trichology, that we could probably put together something that brings people back for continuing education and try to revamp some of that and help these people who've gone too far left as what Dr. Lindsay has brought to this panel today. So I think that's a phenomenal thing. I'm, I'm all up for it. And I think pre, before we went on air, Connie, I invited your organization to the first World Congress of Trichology uh, in, that has been anywhere, which is bringing trichological organizations, reputable trichology organizations, together under the same roof for the first time. And uh, that's going to be in Orlando in September. But um, I think uh, we need to discuss that a little later, not take everybody's time up. But yeah, Absolutely. I agree with you. I agree with you. Yeah, so Dana Majors at, is asking the name of the book, but I think she may be talking about Science Direct when you said that. Oh yeah, no, I think that's uh, what I'm sorry. It, it's it's a, a website, a Science Direct is a website that you can link in directly from the WTS website and uh, have access to these 12,000 and that's part of um, being it's included in being a student and also included in being a member a postgraduate yes yeah so Dr. Victoria Barbosa also said agree Connie those pop-up programs damage the reputation of well-trained trichologists and I think that that is I, so I, I'm gonna kind of go into that a little bit because I'd like to ask the practitioners. Um, so I have spoken to a lot of practitioners and they voice their opinion saying that they don't think that even though they may go through a formalized program, they don't feel prepared coming out of it. And I mean, it, it, with me coming from academia, you know, I don't know if I felt like a real scientist after I finished my curriculum either. You know, it's not until you start getting the experience. But I want to hear from the trichologists, you know, what has been your journey? I mean, how have you felt going through your program and needing to continue your education? This time I'm going to start with Marvelette. Um. So I came out swinging. I was all into trichology. Like I said, I researched 10 years before I even went through the program. And I think that every person over a certain age is responsible for their own learning. I did learn a lot of things at NTTI that I did not know, but I also went out and saw other things and other people, other mm -hmm. uh, doctors and um, studied under a lot of people. And I did a lot of research to find out the things that I didn't know because I wanted mm -hmm. to know. And I offered to share it with other trichologists or people who were interested in learning. So I did get a lot of things, but no one person, no one institution can teach you everything. Right. So I did go out and 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 I even brought things back to the school, right. um, brought people back because right. we needed. I wanted to know, mm -hmm. so I I did. I continued my education. Then I met Dr. Porter. I met you, Dr. Porter, um, mm -hmm. at a conference we both presented at in Vegas, mm -hmm. um, and I continued learning with you. So I'm always taking a class. You can. A lot of people probably on here can say they saw and see me everywhere. I'm always traveling, taking classes. I slowed down a bit these past five years because of other personal reasons, but I'm forever online, on research and reading. I'm a reader, but I, I continue my education all the time because you have to. And I even reached out to other uh, cosmetologists and they, they flat out told me, I don't care to know anything about trichology. They don't want to know. They're more interested in the next phase of hairstyle. They don't want to know about it. And I think that's sad, but it's true. Mm. All right. And how about you, Carrie? Um, so I, I'm glad that we're talking about this, this segment, uh, because what we were just finishing with the, the pop-up locations. And so it, and I agree with Marvelle, she's right. You can't just get it from one particular entity. You have to get it from multiple. It, 
it's really a, a for me i'm gonna say a puzzle it has been for me i can only speak for myself how i've kind of felt like i need to get a piece here and a, a piece there i will say that for sure had i if i could do it all over again that i definitely would have got the education first from a school uh, but again in 2007 when i got into it there were no schools the only thing was the iat and it was just too okay. difficult because again it was across the water it was so far away um, and so how I ended up with um, WTS and just looking around uh, the website, um, but really just wanting something that was structured and it was easy to pay. Um, and we did, we have a support, we have a Facebook group that is very critical to be able to just put in what type of equipment, you know, because we don't even know what type of equipment we should have, what's, what is good, what isn't good. And you can just put a question into the, our Facebook group and say, you know, what type of equipment, do, what kind of mystery do you have or whatever it is. And people respond. And that in itself has been amazing. Um, I think mentorship would be critical. So to go under someone that has had a trichological training at a, a school and then be a mentor that's something that i'm wanting to do because you can't really do it on your own and even studying and, and reading and researching it's always good to have more than one um, brain at trying to, to dissect and process information i thought that that has been really helpful for me as well um, i've had two mentors and the advantage now is again technology dr kingsley spoke about that earlier having the technology to be able to right before you go in to do a consultation your first few consultations you're nervous and jittery and all of that and to be able to virtually say hey i'm about to do this consultation at this time can you please help me through that i didn't have that so it was a phone call i had that but i think mentorship and the at, at, as dr kingsley at world trichology having that post-secondary constant education is going to be critical for success Awesome. Oh, and Donisha? So I totally agree um, with the practitioners on the panel. Um, no one program is going to give you everything that you need. Uh, different programs have different strengths and weaknesses. And so I think that it's very important to vet and research um, the program that you're interested in, identify what it is that you want to bring to um, trichology, how you want to help people. Um, but even after taking that course, you're going to find yourself studying a whole lot more um, than you may have anticipated. I know I did. I, um, when I think about cosmetology, in the cosmetology program, once you complete it, uh, you have the basis, you know, OK, I like coloring or I like cutting or um, I like styling or what what have you. And so trichology to me is very similar. You can take a program, you'll take a course, you'll get the basis um, of understanding hair loss and scalp uh, deformities. However, if you really want to uh, do well with trichology and be able to help as many people as possible, you're going to have to further those studies. And so you may want to dig deeper into scalp deformities or scalp maladies or um, hair disorders um, or, or even into nutrition. And so um, I think that is very important to understand that going into trichology is not a one size fits all. Um, you're not going to have everything that you uh, want or need from one particular course, you're going to need to continue your studies. And there's so much information that's out here. And um, as was mentioned, it changes on a regular basis. So that continuous study is very important. Yeah. And all right, Dana. So I agree with everyone, all the other practitioners on the panel as well. Uh, you start somewhere, a basic um, program, and you need to go out there and just find more information, find more classes, more continued education. This field is ever growing fast. The treatments, the advancements is, is like lightning speed. <laughs> uh, I found for myself that uh, joining organizations like Trichologists on the Mission was crucial for me because it allowed me to um, network with other trichologists and learn about new products that's out there, uh, equipment to use and such like that. So being connected and affiliated with other trichologists was 
crucial for, for, for my practice. But I learned so much from NTTI, the fundamentals. I definitely walked away with knowing how to identify the different various alopecias. And um, I really did feel prepared to um, talk and with my clients and dig deeper in regards to what might be the cause of or the root cause of their hair loss. I felt prepared to do that. However, I did need more help in regards to where are the products? Where, are, where, where do I go to get the equipment? And that's where Trichology is on a mission to help me. So I'm glad you mentioned Trichologists on a mission because I really respect the visionary uh, follow through. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I need help, I need help, but no one actively does anything to bring people in a profession together to collaborate. And that is one of the things that I give Nadia Hughes kudos for, that she is open to sharing and having others come together to share their experiences because that's missing. And I think that, you know, a, a lot of times we get in our silos, right? We all went to a particular institution and so we all want to congregate that way. But with anything in life, when you collaborate, it really makes things much better. And um, yeah, that's great. So I can't believe that we are almost out of time. <laughs> and I want to give everyone an opportunity to just share based on their experience, you know, what would be any take home messages that you would like our watching and listening audience to, to take away. So um, let's start with you, Connie. Thank you, Crystal. And again, thank you for this opportunity. This has been a great discussion we've had. I think my final takeaway is when you invest your money, the investments of your dollars into any program, make sure you vet that program and that that program is viable in taking your tuition payments. Uh, I've heard each person on this panel talk about the dollar part of that. Uh, the, the thing about being authorized through NPEC here in the state of of Georgia is that we had to, in the beginning of this whole deal for many years, have that surety bond in place that governs those tuition payments that students make so that if the school goes out of business or the school is not an operating school under post-secondary education, they cannot be taking tuition payments from anybody. So I would not pay one dime to an entity that does not have the governance of a body and a surety bond to guarantee my funds because if you give me a documentation and you're not governed by that board and you've taken my money, you gave me something that was not viable. And so that's my takeaway. Be careful how you select those programs. When Dana mentioned about the VA paying for it, they had to vet the school in order to pay for her education. When Marvelette started, we had a bond that covered her tuition, you know, back in the days. And this program has revved up many times over because when we started, we didn't have as much education back then with Marvelette as what we had when Dana came and when others have come past Dana because we were constantly evolving. We're on our fifth edition of our textbook at this point. We're always rewriting, updating our training information. And so those are my two takeaways. Be careful where you spend your dollars at. Check that program, go online, see if they're registered with the state as an authorized program before you invest your dollars. Thank you. Dr. Kingsley? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Connie. Um, however, I'd like to add that you, it's, um, important to continue your education um, postgraduate it's important also for the students out there not to give up because sometimes the course can seem a little bit overwhelming sometimes um, the any course uh, but obviously trichology as well you know you're, you're back to school as it were um, don't give up um, and continue to the end and it's worth it then you need to continue improving uh, your education it's like in any field the cosmetologists out here uh, actually what you were saying dr crystal as well when you first qualified as it were you know you 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 know the basics but you don't have the experience so you know, gain the experience, do it slowly, don't worry, you're going to make mistakes. I mean, 40 years as a trichologist, sometimes, you know, you think, hmm, maybe I could have handled that a little bit better. Everybody does. And be critical of yourself and, and grow, grow.
grow, grow, grow. And don't worry. Don't let anything push you back. Just say, you know, I think I'll learn from that. Next time I'm going to do it this way. And you do it this way. And yeah. you continue bettering yourself. Uh, as uh, Dana was saying, you know, there's so much changes that happen almost every day, but every month at least, that, you know, you need to keep up to date with. And, you know, it's not difficult. You just put some time aside. You say, right, you know, Mondays is my school day. and I'm going to, you know, go to the library or leave me alone. I'm in my room. I'm going to learn these things. Even if you're already certified, you need to continue. Look at physicians. Dr. Lindsay, I'm sure, has to continue medicate, uh, medication, continued medical credits. Even physician, you want to go to a physician that has these medical credits because then you know that the physician knows all the modern stuff. And it's the same with trichologists. Keep learning, keep taking courses. I think all the panel was saying, keep taking courses, even if it's from other organizations. We have a lot of postgraduate courses. We've got uh, uh, regarding blood tests, how you read them as a trichologist. Yes, you work with a physician, but there are certain uh, normal ranges that sometimes physicians might not be aware of. For instance, let's say ferritin. That is iron storage, very big in the trichology industry. Uh, the normal range, let's just say, is 10 to 150. That's a big normal range. Somebody comes in at 15. Oh, they're normal medically. Yes, they are, but not trichologically. Trichologically, it needs to be a little higher, maybe around 70. Not outside the range, but nicely positioned in the middle of the range. So these are like little things that you can do and you work with a physician. And don't be trying to work with a physician. Most physicians are very, very open to somebody who is um, that can help their patients. That's what it's all about, isn't it? Helping people. So I'm going long winded. I'm so sorry, Dr. Crystal. But keep educating yourself. Thank you. And so um, what I am going to do is share everyone's contact information on the chat in the various platforms where this has streamed live so everyone will know how to contact everyone. And um, I just like to thank our special guests for taking time to share their experiences and expertise. I am really grateful um, for the care that you provide. And um, there are some comments. I know I didn't have a chance to get to them. I may not have named you personally, but I see you and I thank you. And I, I will definitely respond a little later. And so um, I know some of you will be watching the replay and want to share your personal experience or ask questions in a more personal setting. So let's continue to have this conversation. If you haven't done so already, please join our Black Hair Care Matters Movement group on Facebook, and then you can put your questions there. Um, and you may even want to address some of the guests that we've had on the panel, so feel free to do that as well. And um, if you need a vetted professional, because that's one of the things that I am trying to bridge that gap in making sure that the public has access to people who have been vetted, you can go to bit.ly OBHM Consult and schedule an appointment to be connected with one of my vetted team members, three of which are on here. We have Marvelette, we have Dana, and we also have Donisha. So always remember that our Black hair matters. And as always, take yeah. care and love your hair. Thank you. Bye-bye.